hello and welcome to this edition of the Rest is Entertainment Questions Edition. And I'm Marina Hyde, I've remembered to say this week. And I'm Richard Osman. Uh, welcome to this Question and Answers Edition. I, can I tell you what I think the issue is with the introduction? Yeah. Why it trips you every time? Yeah. I think so you say the word edition twice. Oh. You say welcome to this edition of uh, the Questions Edition. There's and I a think sort of synaptic if, short circuit. I think if you were writing that, you would you would cut out one of the editions. I think if I was writing it. Yeah, I was listening to the podcast last week and I thought, do you know what? That's my note. Oh, okay, right. Well, next week, it's yes. such a work in progress, that introduction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Listen, I we, love yeah, that it's, we've only you know, been doing you see something different every time. I've only been doing it for a year or so. It's not a year. Yeah, <laughs> a year or so. Yeah. Um, Hi, anyway. Hi. Nice to see you. We have lots and lots of great questions. We have some. any other business first? You remember last week we were talking about um, toilet flushes for various <laughs> reasons. We were trying to work out the first ever toilet flush on television, which I thought was um, step two and some. But we have a movie one here uh, from Stephen Woodward. Hi there, sis Stephen Woodward. Hi, Stephen. I have my long-suffering wife, Emma, to thank for this particular piece of trivia. Hi, Emma. She was once a film and media lecturer and told me the first cinematic toilet flush was in Psycho. <gasps> Yeah, Long ago. Long ago. At one point, Marion is shown flushing a toilet in the Bates Motel with its contents, pieces of torn up notepaper, fully visible. Up until that point, no flushing toilet had ever appeared in mainstream film and television in the United States. Well, I mean, that now for me is the film's major innovation. Yeah, isn't it? Just so thank you, Stephen Woodward. But more importantly, thank you, Emma Woodward. Or she may have... And indeed, Alfred Hitchcock. And thank you uh, to Alfred Hitchcock and to Vivian Lee. It's much appreciated. And thank you to Thomas Crapper as well for... Uh, with. Janet. And thank you also to Janet Lee. And thank you also to Thomas Crapper, without whom uh, none of us would be here. Everybody gets a shout out on this show. Um, shall I ask you a question? Please do. This comes from, whoa. Are you looking for a strong name I'm to start with? I'm looking for a strong name. This is from Rowan Stromenger. Yeah? That's an action hero name. Yeah, Rowan Stromenger has a question. Rowan says, in recent times, songs, specifically pop rap, have got progressively shorter. Oh, she says have gotten progressively shorter. That's interesting, which means maybe American. Sometimes my children say that and I correct them. I way. like it. I, no, I like gotten. I think it's one of those words I quite like to come into the English language. Should we? Let's do a question. Let's do a question. Let's do a Please. question. Rowan says, in recent times, songs, specifically pop rap, <laughs> have gotten progressively shorter. Could you give context to why this is. Could you give what, please? Context. <laughs> Sorry, I've, it sounded something different. Um, okay. <laughs> the, they have definitely, definitely got shorter in gotten shorter in the um, in the fifties and sixties. You know, you'd get those very short songs, yeah. sort of two and a half minutes, yeah, and you'd hear things like Eddie Cochran and Buddy Holly, and they're really sort of tight, concise songs. But then it bloats like many yeah. things it bloats and i think they get to their longest i did a little bit of research into this they get to their longest in the 90s where the average song length is something like four minutes 20. okay originally by the way song lengths were what's how much would fit on one side of a vinyl record without sort of too much compromising the yes often the quality. technology is why is yeah. why things are certain lengths right and and also advertising segments, news, radio, all these sort yeah. of things. No one really wants to hear your seven minute epic, which is why we get things like radio edits and things like yeah. that. But obviously when tapes and CDs came along, they could go longer. Oh, hang on. The Beatles, Hey Jude is very long. It's about yes. seven minutes, but they were the Beatles and they could do literally anything they wanted. And also they'd done a lot of short songs before that. Yeah. And, so. and they were the Beatles. So they could do what they liked. But um, nowadays it has become much shorter and it's quite interesting. If you look at sort of like... Taylor Swift, um, that's on Speak Now, which I think came out in 2010, um, the, the songs are a whole minute longer in that than they are on Midnight's. Really? And that speaks of a general tr trend. In If you're on Spotify, by the way, artists only get royalties if the listener has stayed engaged, basically listened to it for 30 seconds or more. So it's affected. It, all songs have got much shorter because, and also people want to clip them and they used, mm. want to use them on TikTok and things like that. And that is such a big part of artist promotion now that the artist realises and are not giving us their seven minute epics any longer. So you're not going to do a big long intro because you don't want people want to switch no. off after 25 seconds, get straight into a hook. You're, you, well, you're quite right. It starts, the, so many of these songs start with choruses, start mm. with hooks. And actually it's something you also see and bridges have sort of almost disappeared because it's things where people think not a lot happens unless you're Taylor Swift and your bridges are amazing. Um, but uh, This is like the rest is engineering. It, yeah, it, it, it bridges, is. Bridges have disappeared. <laughs> but um, and so to some extent, it's about attention. But you do also see it in films. If you're watching a film, a sort of fun action comedy from the 80s, it takes a long time hey. to get going compared to if you're watching a Marvel film where you'll have a massive sequence almost before the titles. Yeah. 
Um, and so lots of things have had to work on hooking your attention in immediately. And songs are just one of those things. And if you, if you look at the... Um, Half of Spotify's songs last year in 2023 were under three minutes. Yeah. And one of the big songs, Poland, Little Yachty, Poland, is like 80 odd seconds. I love it. And it's obviously been endlessly TikToked, endlessly sampled for all sorts of little things, little viral bits of content. So the artists realize this as well, which is why they're sort of self censoring in terms of their big epics. But as so often, the artistic things follow technical yeah. things and technological things i if you can make a longer record and it makes you more money then that's what you do not because you want to make more money but just you, you can do and the second someone says actually it's sort of better if you make this two minutes 30 rather than three minutes 30 to a lot of genuinely creative people that's quite a fun thing to be told yeah you know they're not kind of going oh, i'm going to be cynical and do that they kind of go oh okay so eurovision for example the songs have to be three minutes and that's because you know you cut it for a, a, a tv show and it's yeah. uh, so three minutes but that's a creative thing for people to do if things have to be certain lengths creative people often quite like it and when suddenly they're allowed to do the director's cuts of things and they can be six hours it doesn't always work um but it's uh yeah often it follows the technology and as you say the spotify thing of if people listen to 30 seconds of this then you're getting paid that uh you're going to stick it all on up front <laughs> yeah you really are but it's like did the pilot of a big american tv show you literally all the explosions everything oh my god the worst thing ever happened this week I'd, I'd forgotten, Tell me. which is um, I love the night manager, yes. like the John Le Carre yeah. thing that was on BBC with Hugh Laurie and what have you. Tom Hiddleston. Uh, and I'd watched it four or five years ago. Ingrid had not watched it. And I said, I said, this is definitely one of those ones that I will watch again because I absolutely loved it. So we were watching this thing and I thought this, it starts really, I thought two things. I thought it starts really big. I mean, the first episode, like yeah. a lot is happening. Um, and I also thought it's great that they're not, and it's very Le Carre and it's very, very, you know, sort of modern drama. It's not explaining a lot. Like, you know, Olivia Coleman gets introduced. We're not told who, who she is. We, we, we have to surmise who she is. Uh, and as we got towards the end, I realized we were watching the last episode, not the first episode. <laughs> Oh, it's like, and you know, Ingrid was really enjoying it. And she's going, God, they pack a lot into this episode. Where's this going? And I was like, yeah, yeah. And in my head, I was thinking, yeah, I think this does happen. And then this is the bit. And then you sort of go back, like it's a year later and, you know, and no, it was, it was the, it was the last episode. I love how this doesn't insult the audience. The, yeah, but it really wasn't. <laughs> I, I, I really thought this, it, it was like a big holly, you know, it was like, like, like a big uh, opening uh, episode of something that they want a series of but no, that's it amazing isn't it episode. a lot of writers will tell you uh, a lot of writers trick is think where you want your series to end or your episode to end yeah. and then just force yourself to make it miles better by making that end of that one yes yeah exactly. and a lot of people uh, yeah. and so it, it, and also uh, about you know where you drop into something i'm coming in at the latest possible moment well yeah. they really were coming in at the latest possible moment yes, <laughs> no. we were, I mean, yeah. just come in on episode five yeah but it was terrible because ingrid's like oh great so let's just watch episode two immediately and i'm like I have some bad news about episode two, <laughs> and we can watch episode two, but it, it'll it'll feel like a prequel, and, it, and it'll be a lot more gently paced. <laughs> but anyway, listen, it's a it's an amazing one off last episode. I'll, I will I will give it that. Um, I know that doesn't answer your question, Rowan, but uh, I, I, hopefully, that hopefully has, I did. That has been answered. Yes, <laughs> I just as a point of order felt I should mention it. Um, this is quite an open ended one for you, Richard. Lisa Nandy. Tom from, Harbert. From, from Lisa and Andy. Not from Lisa and Andy. She hasn't written. The Culture Secretary writes, no. Tom Harbert writes of the Culture Secretary, yeah. will Lisa and Andy save Channel 4? Oh, that's a good question. Well, firstly, um, speaking on behalf of podcasters, welcome, Lisa and Andy. If you're the Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport, you are the Secretary of State for podcasts, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the, that's that, that's like your area. Typically, the culture secretary would hate all the aspects of their brief in if to follow the form book or would just there would be something that they knew absolutely nothing about. Exactly, where she seems to actually quite like the media in various ways. Well, she saved Channel 4. It's an interesting... <laughs> she, seems quite like, she does seem to quite like the media, yeah. yes. Uh, and sport. Yeah. So that's good. And culture, I guess. It's a very good question. I mean, Channel 4 has to save itself for sure, and Channel 4 know that, and they save themselves by making new shows and by finding new sources of revenue and by sort of increasing eyes across various different bits of the media. One thing she won't do is get in the way of that, I think. And, you know, they did have a tricky time under the Tory government because they were constantly being, um, you know, threatened with privatisation. I never bought that. Uh, I always thought it was trolling. I thought, you know, when Nadine Doris is saying we're going to privatise Channel 4, I, thought, I don't think you have the power or the will to do that, Nadine Doris. But if you're running Channel 4... 
you do it's a clear and present danger and you do have to address it and it does destabilize people and it does destabilize the, the the people who are working for you so will she save it i mean they have to save themselves they save themselves by commissioning great shows but knowing that th there's not an existential threat to them i think will be very very helpful certainly if they haven't saved themselves in three years there will no longer be an excuse that is that is definitely the case but i think yeah the the climate where one imagines that the Labour government will be um, sympathetic to drama makers and to independent producers in Britain, which, to be fair, the Tories were sort of were also, you know, there's lots of tax breaks. And I don't, don't imagine she's about to stop them because that industry brings a huge amount of money in. But it's down to, I mean, you know, my view on these things. Uh, I'm not sure anyone's going to save any of those linear channels, you know, if we're talking yeah. about 15 years time. I'm not sure any of them exist in the way that they currently do. So, you know, you could definitely run the best steam railway in the 1950s for sure. And, you know, you could maximize your income from from that, but it's not going to stop the electrification of the railways. So, you know, I, I my view has always been if you make content, you're like someone who makes seats for trains. And so it doesn't matter to you if they're steam trains or if they're electric trains. If you are a linear television channel and it's hard for... Uh, someone like Channel 4 to break out of being a linear television channel, whatever digital strategy they have, they're still encumbered by their legacy and what they are. I think it's hard for them to build that business. I think we're sort of in the era of managing decline with the best will in the world. And if they manage it well, then we'll have a lovely 15 years of great TV from the BBC and ITV and Channel 4. And if they manage it badly, then we, we will have less. I don't think there's an awful lot that Lisa and Andy can do to change the viewing habits of a generation and to change the spending habits of a generation of advertisers. If there is, is, a lot of people want to hear from her. Yes, exactly. <laughs> She's always absolutely wasted in that particular role because she doesn't have the power in that role to do a whole lot about that. Yeah, so I think all, all she can do is leave them be to get on with their own business plan, which I think she will do. So I think yes. that that's very good news for Channel 4. But I think if we're thinking in 15 years' time, the media landscape is going to be the same, um, then uh, I, I suspect that is not what is going to happen. But you, you can definitely extend the life of Channel 4 and you can make some great TV shows and you can add to the joy of British culture. Um, but, you know, there's, there's, there's going to be a stop date to all of that stuff. I hope that's not too much of a downer. But not it, at know, all. Yeah, not at all. Uh, Vanessa Moritz has a question for you, Marina. She asks, why are movie trailers being released earlier and earlier in recent years? F1 with Brad Pitt was 12 months before the uh, show came out. Uh, Joker, Folie Deux, six months before. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, also six months before. Why, why are they being released so early these days? Right, well, there's, there's a few answers to that. Um, the sort of basic one is hype. All of those movies that you've just mentioned, they re all of those different studios really have spent a lot of money on these and want and need them to be massive. So there's a sort of thing that the longer people have to wait, the, may, the more they want something. I don't know if that's necessarily true. And then another reason is that theatrical audiences, people going out to the cinema, it, it's becoming smaller and smaller numbers. So it takes longer to reach the, the amount of people you need to make something mm. a big hit. And you have to sort of start, start spreading it out because they're just not seeing as many films as they used to. So yeah. you want that. Also, partly... We're still on the sort of downstream effects of the various writers' strikes. There's a sort of hiatus in... They won't make it feel like that. They'll have something out all the time. But there is a hiatus in big movies because there was the, both writers and the screen actors strike and they put obviously a complete stop on production. So things are being introduced earlier and earlier. Another reason is, and I, in some ways the most interesting reason, is to do with marketing um, and we talked before about tracking and how tracking is the studio's ways of seeing how their movies are going to open. And often these are movies that they spent a lot of money on. And to some extent, it will be a, a form of dynamic pricing, mm. dynamic cost, the marketing. If they feel that Beetlejuice isn't getting enough purchase and they want, I actually personally think Beetlejuice is going to be a big hit because yes. of General Ortega and it, it brings young audiences and whatever. But if they, they want to know that it's going to be a big hit and they want to see ways in which they can spend it. And if they, so getting that engagement via tracking, if people become aware of those movies, which they might largely via trailers and cinemas at that point, then you're going to start being able to see on the tracking, like, are people mentioning this film spontaneously in their socials? Are they doing all these different things? Um, and then you can see where you might spend more on marketing to ensure that your big film is a hit. Yeah, well, that's the key thing is in the old days with a the trailer, there's only really 
two places to play it. You play it in the cinema with other films, which is good because you know it's a captive audience of people who like watching films, or you play it on television. And the key to do that is you play it maybe a week before because people want to yeah. book their tickets, or you play it when on opening day. Whereas now people are watching trailers online. So there's a huge new marketplace to show your wares. And if you want to release, you know, the Beetlejuice trailer six months ahead, you stick it on YouTube. And as you say, you can absolutely track how well it's doing. You can look at every single comment. You get this incredible data six months out from this movie um, coming out. And then you absolutely just refine your message. You see which bits people like. You can recut the trailer. You are just doing all of your market research ahead of time. But they didn't used to be able to do that because they could show it to a, a focus group you know that's something they could have done but you're not getting a huge amount now whereas now you're getting this real-time stuff because putting out a trailer is not a bad thing at any time you want people to see uh, yeah. what what it is you've got ahead of you and all movies you've got the footage for the trailer a long time before the movie comes out anyway that that hasn't changed but now you have this incredible opportunity where you can see this film so long in advance and it makes it feel it gives it a sort of an inevitability like with the marvel cinematic universe that we talked about on tuesday when you know a film is coming out in 2027 it's almost like oh the the train is coming to the station. so And have, you have that yeah. awareness. That it's, yeah. Exactly that. And so if you can do that, but this incredible resource now they have that they can put out a trailer and you can do their market research for them in real time is something yeah. they just didn't used to have. And this is why you'll see the teaser trailer. Yeah. Then you'll see a first official trailer, second official trailer. They, you know, they, can't, they all come in stages now. It's interesting. I was talking to a director about this the other day who said on day one of shooting his film, he was told that he needed to provide some footage for the trailer. He was like, what? Wow. Day one of the shoot, it was a very big sort of franchise movie and had to provide on day one so that they can already start working and putting little bits of things out there. They're starting so far in advance to get that sort of hype. But because, and again, for another reason, we say that we live in this quite siloed world and it's quite possible that you might not hear about things yeah. because your particular kind of atomized area of the internet that talks about your interests aren't seeing them. So they want kind of saturation as much as possible because they want everything to be a four quadrant movie if it possibly can be. Which as you say is young men, young women, young men, older men, older, older women. women. They want everything to appeal to everybody all the time yeah and that side thing is fascinating because i know you see it in all sorts of areas now that if you think that something is being trailed endlessly that says less about the thing and more about the media that the you, way you've set that, up that your... you consume because yeah. i i might think an entirely different thing is being you know i might think that walk-in baths are endlessly being advertised because <laughs> i watch countdown so if you see something doing endlessly they are it is not it is not being marketed at you yeah. Right. It is desperately trying to find people who would not see this normally. It's trying to find each, you know, which is why Coca Cola is still advertised because you just you need to keep mopping up people and mopping up people. But yeah, I think yeah, the short answer is I think because they can put the trailer out a year in advance now when yeah. they, they didn't used to be able to. So the combined views on YouTube of the three trailers they've had so far so far for Beetlejuice are fifty one million. You know, which is insane and something that you didn't used to be able to do, something you wouldn't have been able to have, and. Almost more importantly is are the comments underneath because sometimes amongst and there's obviously you can ignore eighty percent of all comments but sometimes something in there will be gold yeah and people you'll you'll get an idea of what it is that people are responding to what people like what people want to see more of what people want to see less of I mean it's, it's and it a, will affect the fourth trailer they bring out for it exactly that now this is a bit of a follow up to our discussion about Olympic commentators last week. Aid Grayson says, I love watching sports I don't normally see when the Olympics rolls around. Last Q&A episode, you spoke about generalist commentators and then being alongside a former athlete in said sport. But how do commentators on events like skateboarding, surfing or BMX, which have such niche tricks and phrases, go about making it easy to understand for people like me who only catch it every four um, years? Such a good question. Um, I love having those sports because remember the X Games was huge for yeah. a while and actually the Olympics seems to have drawn some of the energy of that. Now, the guys I absolutely love are Ed and Tim who do the BMX and stuff yeah. are so enthusiastic and actually are very, very good at making you understand what's going on and making you feel included. So we asked them personally how they go about exactly this. We asked this exact question. How do you go about bringing people in and making these sports understandable for, uh, for people watching them for the first time and this is what they had to say. Hello, my name's Tim Warwood and this is Ed Lee. 
And we are BBC Action Sports commentators. So, great question. Uh, to kick it off, both Tim and I are semi-professional athletes yeah. or were. Former, former semi-professional. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've both made a living out of translating the esoteric elements of action sports to mainstream audiences. It's a long craft. It takes a long time to get the hang of it and work out how you do that and what works for people. We started off in live, so we would do a lot of snowboard and skate, BMX contests, um, demos, things like that. To You know, often you'd find yourself up in Newcastle on a rainy day with a, a freestyle motocross ramp, motorbikes jumping through the air, and you're having to explain these tricks. And you can see in real time on people's faces whether or not they're getting what you're actually saying. So you learn very quickly how to translate, like Ed says, translate this kind of very niche sport into something that people can understand. And the thing that I always take, especially when we're doing, you are specifically about the skateboarding. I mean, the trick names in that are so complex and the sport is incredibly uh, effective at policing itself. If you get any of those tricks wrong, as Mark Churchill will tell you, and my co-commentator on that, but one of the most amazing elements of it is that you can treat it like a bedtime story for a sixth month old. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you say. It's all about your pitch, your tone and your level of excitement. So it's backside 50-50 through the corner there, frontside Smith setting up and then he's exploded out of that into a big kickflip melon. And, yeah. and you know, you don't need to know what the trick is, but you know when it's good that way. The second part of the question here is, uh, well, it kind of made us both laugh really, but yeah, it's saying, going on to say, um, can you be both commentator and expert due to the specialism of the sport? Um, I think the answer is no, <laughs> or maybe a hard trying to. Well, you say that neither of us are were professional BMXers, but we can appreciate it. We understand all of the tricks and the entomology of them, where they come from. So we can describe it all, but we don't know the details. We can't break down that really, really detailed trick analysis, but we can still make it fun for people. So it depends who you are and what you want from your commentary, I suppose. Yeah. Ah, oh, that's absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much to uh, Tim and Ed. That's great, right? Yeah. I mean, that's God, they, they answered the question. They really did. And I, I, I like that they often don't actually know the full detail. You can't possibly know some of the stuff you can't possibly know. And no one expects you to know the absolute full details. It is so much better, though, when people understand some. Because yeah. honestly, when they're just sitting there going, wow, or did you see yeah. that? Yeah, I did see it. I'm watching it at home. Yeah. Can you tell me something about it, please? And there are commentators out there like couldn't be further from Ed and Tim who who do give you very very little I find but the pitch of voice thing is absolutely perfect isn't it because yeah. as you say when I'm watching the skateboarding they, they all, it all looks good like we talked about the synchronised diving last week it, yeah. it, they all look like they're really good at synchronised diving but when a commentator loses their mind at something you, you, like when there's a laughter track on a sitcom you instantly go, oh my God, I, can, I can't believe you just did that. Well, even though your eyes just went, oh no, that was just the same as the last person did. So it's that, that the, the picture voice for a six month Well, it can cover a multitude funny. of sins, we yes. should also say, because I'll tell you, you never, you never see Hazel Irving. Uh, do no, she, doesn't need to. she doesn't need to lose it because she knows it all. Yeah, uh, and and she's got that great tone. So I I totally agree that the tone is very very important. As with anything in life, any form of writing or speaking, the tone is very almost important. more important than but, the substance. Uh, I'm absolutely loving the uh, the BBC coverage of the Olympics because the the magic trick they're pulling off, which is incredibly impressive, is they don't have a huge amount of the rights anymore. No, because, Discovery you know, have the big package. Discovery have the big package, so that the BBC are sort of it still feels like they've got the rights to everything and they're able to show us everything and you've got this incredible footage on on, on um, iPlayer, the switching in between sports. So it's a very, very neat trick they're pulling off, which is I still feel like I'm watching all of the Olympics. I certainly feel like I'm watching everything where, you know, British medalists uh, are involved or, you know, exciting names and, you know, like the, the 100 metres final from yesterday. So they're, do they're doing an amazing job, I think. And what a group are presented you've got Claire Borden you've got Jeanette Quache you've got um Gabby Logan I mean just like just great and the great experts I'll sit and listen to Michael Johnson all day long uh so I I, I think it's been an absolute master class in in how to do something incredibly difficult and make it look fairly simple even though people will say oh why did you cut from this to that and why did you cut from that to that you think well because you have to yeah and because we're not allowed to be on six o'clock on bbc2 you know we we have to sort of change channels every now and again and like i was watching the final andy murray 
um, match and it was at the same time as the swimming final and you think oh god what do you do here because everyone wants to watch both of these things uh, and you know you do have to navigate that but I, I think if you had to sit down for one minute and work out that BBC schedule and work out what they had to do and understand how they had to put that running order Together. It's much harder than when it in 2012 is. they had the red button for absolutely you could go yeah, yeah, to yeah. absolutely everything because they had everything. Yeah. Um, but they haven't had that um, in recent last two games, I think. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't know that, and I think that's a testament yeah. to, to how how well it's been put together. Um, I loved Ed and Tim. Any yes. other questions you have for Ed and Tim? Send them in. I could listen to them all day. This episode is brought to you by Sky. Now, Richard, you have a brother. I do. The wonderful Matt Osman from Suede. Uh, why do you ask? Would you describe yourselves as close? Yes, different industries, but yeah, we love each other. You sound closer than the two brothers in the new Sky original, Mr. Big Stuff. Stars Danny Dyer as yes, Lee. Please. An alpha male with a prescription drug addiction, as well as a biscuit tin full of their dad's ashes. Also, okay. yes, please. And Ryan Sampson as Glenn, a nervy perfectionist and carpet salesman striving to live the suburban ideal with his fiance. Glenn's life is very peaceful and exactly how he likes it until his brother comes crashing into their lives and it's not long before their perfect lives start to unravel faster than the weave of a cheap carpet. Ryan Sampson also wrote the series. He's an absolutely fantastic comic actor. He was in Plebs and, of course, Brassic, another Sky comedy. All episodes available to watch now, only on Sky. Uh, Marina, I have a question from Oliver Needham. Oliver asks, why are cash prizes tax-free in the UK? Like on quizzes and yeah. competitions and things like that. I believe there was something about there having to be a skill involved to make it not betting. But just texting a word to win doesn't appear to be a skill. <laughs> yes, um, I think it's, it's the Gambling Act of 2005 that says that, you, it, that there needs to be some element of skill in yeah. the question. But it can be... I mean, so it would be like, if you were talking about this, it would be like, what podcast are you currently listening Listen to? to? And is even then. The rest is entertainment. The rest is enlightenment. Or the rest is embarrassment. But it, there has to be a reasonable assumption that some people will right. answer one of the wrong ones. Now, if you've ever heard me do a top three in <laughs> an eccentric order, then a number of people might write in and yeah. say, it's the rest of his embarrassment. Surely, surely that is the name of this show. In, it doesn't tend to be enforced. So our prizes, everything, including the millionaire prize, anything else is tax free, which makes you think, hang on, in other countries, can you like win a car and have to pay 50 percent tax on it? The answer is yes. In the US, it is utterly brutal. Anything you win on any of their many game shows is immediately taxable. You are given the, the television show gives you a form as they're giving you the prize off camera and they also send that form to the IRS the the, the revenue service in the U, in the USA and so they know that you have won a car and if you can't pay the tax on it so some people it's it's really common practice to say could i have if not the cash value of this because then it's much easier to pay the tax yeah. to say can i have half the cash value of this because i honestly so if they're giving you some luxury holiday and you're like well, hang on, I'm going to actually end up having to pay $6,000 yeah, yeah. for whatever percentage of this luxury holiday, then can I not have it actually, please? And it's really, it's, so if it's a non-cash prize, it's very problematic. And some prizes remain totally unclaimed in the event of actual winning because people are told and they have this whole chat when they're given the form and they think, Actually, it's too expensive for me to have this prize, isn't that? Which is pretty awful. So it's quite nice that we have that. Yeah. So over here, it's always been the case, and you know, um, certainly fifteen, twenty years ago, a lot of the companies were getting involved in gaming and gambling, and that is, you know, you, you'd have fixed odds games based on deal or no deal and stuff like that, and that you do get taxed on because it is entirely yeah. random. But yeah, the second there's even a vague amount of skill, and as you say, we we once showed a picture of the planet Earth on Pointless. Uh, with the letter E underneath it and said, what planet is this? And it's called 91, right? So, you know, showing a picture of planet Earth and saying, what is it, is a game of skill because yeah. some, some people will not get that or right. Or 9% of people. I mean, that is extraordinary. But yeah. every all of these questions, when you think, this is so imbecilic, no one could possibly get this wrong. <laughs> I'm afraid anyone who produces those shares will tell you that's many, the, many get it wrong. That's the thing. Whenever you play games on your phone and there's all those adverts for other games, which are sort of strategy games or, you know, matching, you know, three symbols and stuff like that. And they deliberately play them badly while you're watching it for 30 seconds because you go, oh, my God, I could, I could definitely do that. I 
he's, oh my God, he's being an idiot. Because he just, those three together, you think, yeah, they they know it's the simplest thing in the world and they deliberately do them wrong just so you think, oh, I could, I could, I could this. definitely do that. One, uh, just, a, just a sidebar to this question, when people sometimes say, why don't people ever give away the fact that they've won a prize? Because if you film a show, uh, you know, even celebrity shows, you say, look, you can, when it comes out, you can say definitely say you've been on. You can definitely, when it comes out, you can write about it, but don't like show a picture of you with the prize or with you know a, a trophy or anything like that. And if you're on a regular TV show, if you do Millionaire, for example, and you win the million pounds, and the, of course the first thing you want to do is tell everybody, you do not get the money until your episode goes out. Yeah. So it's when your episode literally is shown, it's when you get sent that check which is why nobody ever goes online and says, I want a million quid, because contractually, that money could be taken away from them if they tell people that they've already run it, won it before the show goes out. So that's another thing. If you win a lot of money on a, on a game show, you might have to wait 18 months before you actually get that money and are able to spend it. But it will be tax-free. Oh, do we have time for one more? Because I like this one from Emily Barr. Emily says, I saw Sophie Ellis Bexter at Tram Lines in Sheffield, and she played various songs by other artists. Can I tell you a very quick Sophie Ellis Bexter story? Please do, story, halfway through the question. Which I I'm so to. sorry. Only because she turned on the Christmas lights in Chiswick <gasps> a couple of years ago, and the mayor of Chiswick clearly didn't know who she was and introduced her as Sophie Ellis and Bexter. But like, like it was a dog act. And so whenever she's on TV now, we always say, oh, there's Sophie Ellison Bexter. I love that also you attended the the yeah. Under the Lights. Of course, I mean, of absolutely. Course, because I'm a big fan. There's two people I'm a big fan of, Sophie Ellis and Bexter. Yeah. Um, sorry, Emily, to uh, hijack your question. And now the she's... second half of Emily's question. Yes, exactly. She saw Sophie Ellis Bexter and Bexter at Tram Lines in Sheffield play various songs by other artists. If an artist wants to cover someone else's songs, do they need to ask permission? What happens if the original artist is dead? Do they need to get permission from their estate? OK, well, I guess, Emily, you were talking about live because that's how you saw her. In general, if you're doing a performance of something live and it's not going to be recorded um, and you're not going to publish it, then it's sort of fair game. You can do any old covers you want. But... The venue that you're doing it, it will need to have a PRS license. Now, this, these PRSs are performing rights organisations and they make sure that musicians get royalties, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it's not a huge amount for a venue to have one every year. And if a venue suddenly says, oh, we don't want ours anymore, then the performing rights organisations here in the United States are so hot on this. They will effectively send out spies to say, yeah, I saw someone doing a silly dance on this. Yeah. And <laughs> apparently you don't have a PRS license. So that's a bit weird, isn't it? So... They're very, very hot on that. A venue has to pay a certain amount a year and it's not a huge amount and they get a small amount per, per show and you get the artists get royalties. However, um, if you you are supposed to report the performance, you are supposed to report a set list. By the way, even buskers are supposed to do this, wow. to say, you know, when I was on the underground the other day, I did whatever set list you did. And it, it, your busking licence is, is much less and it's as much a smaller... Uh, and you'll get a smaller royalty, but it is all supposed to be covered by this. Um, yeah. You still get a lot for Wonderwall yeah. if, if it's all the buskers in Britain added together. Oh yeah, I mean it's huge. But you're you're and and you're supposed to do it, and you're supposed in practice it often doesn't happen. But you are supposed to report set set lists. But by and large, you don't need permission to cover someone else's song. It's not you obviously have to pay, but uh, you don't need permission. Sometimes you need permission if you want to change words or change lyrics and stuff like that. You then have to seek permission. You have to seek permission if it's uh, you, you know, but. By and large, you can record someone's song. So an, an example would be, uh, you know, Nirvana, when they're at their absolutely most massive and they did the Unplugged concert, which was absolutely huge and sold so many copies. And they did a, a cover of um, the Vaselines, who are a very cool uh, indie Glasgow band, Jesus Wants Me for a Sunbeam. Um, they covered that because Kurt Cobain was a huge fan of the Vaselines. And, you know, I can't tell you exactly how much uh, the Vaselines made from that. But it was an awful lot, you know, probably as much as the Zootons made from Amy Winehouse doing Valerie. So it's one of those things. If you record something and it's on an album, you you do Once have to pay a lot. Once it's recorded, you're in a yeah. whole different kettle of fish. But if you're if 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 it's just if it's live, yeah, you, you do can as, get away yeah. with more. So Sophie Ellis and Bexter are absolutely fine <laughs> doing that, I would say. But also part of the nature of live music is that you don't want to have to say to people ages in advance, "Can you tell me the exact songs you'll be yeah. doing tonight in the exact order, so that I can go and go to all the that that's what the PRI's license." Is for is to preserve some of that, you know, let, let's do this one tonight. Yeah. In, or, so in order that you can have that sort of spont spontaneity. Yeah, exactly. I think that's us done for I another think that is us done. edition of the question and answers edition. Of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. I will modify next week. Yeah. Uh, but before then, we will have the main edition of the show. So please do join us. We do, yeah. We'll, uh, we will see you next Tuesday. See you next Tuesday. Bye.